Hello, welcome everybody. My name is Nadia Ali. I'm the director of the Center for Middle East Studies at Brown University, where I'm professor of Middle East Studies and Anthropology. And it's my great pleasure to host today's event. Um, I'll be joined by Professor Gil Hochberg. Professor Hochberg is the Ransford Professor of Hebrew and Visual Studies, Comparative Literature and Middle East Studies at Columbia University, where she is currently Chair of the Department of Middle Eastern, South Asian and African Studies. Professor Hochberg's research focuses on the intersections of psychoanalysis, post-colonial theory, nationalism, gender and sexuality. She has published essays on a wide range of issues, including Francophone, North African and Palestinian literature, the modern Levant, gender and nationalism, cultural memory and immigration, memory and gender, Hebrew literature, Israeli and Palestinian cinema, Mediterraneanism, trauma and narrative. Her first book, in spite of partition, Jews, Arabs and the limits of separatist imagination was published by Princeton University Press in 2007. It examines the complex relationship between the signifiers Arab and Jew in contemporary Jewish and Arab literatures and cultural imagination. Her second book, Visual Occupations, Vision and the Visibility in the Conflict Zone was published by Duke University Press in 2015. And it is a study of the visual politics of the Israeli-Palestinian terrain and the emergence of a conflict or the site of a conflict. But today we're of course discussing her third book, Becoming Palestine Toward an Archival Imagination of the Future, which was published recently by Duke University Press. Welcome, Gail. It's wonderful uh, to have you here, of course, not in person, which would be much more fun and greater. <laughs> we could, um, you know, go out afterwards, but um, for the time being, this is what it has to be. Uh, so just to um, tell everyone about the structure of the event, um, Gil and I will be in conversation, um, and then you are welcome to put in your comments and questions in the Q&A function. And I very much hope that we will have time to engage with those questions and comments towards the end of the hour. So uh, Gil, I was uh, thinking that before delving into the book itself, I was wondering whether you could share your trajectory. Um, I mean, that the trajectory that led you to writing the book. Um, so I was particularly intrigued to hear that um, although you did not actually plan it as such, um, Becoming Palestine, your third book, ended up being actually a third book in a trilogy. Um, and, you know, they're, they're your first book dealing with the past, your second book dealing with the present, and then Becoming Palestine, I assume, dealing with the future. Can you tell us a little bit about that trajectory? Yes, thank you. Um, just before I dive right in, I do want to thank uh, Nadia El Ali um, uh, for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be in conversation uh, with you, uh, Nadia, and also to voice my um, you know, regret that this is the format, but I fully understand. I also want to thank Barbara uh, for all of the um, patience with which she's been handling uh, um, all the technological and other issues. I want to thank the Center for Middle East Studies and, of course, the uh, Watson Institute. So I'm very, very happy to be here. Um, so in terms of, and of course, our guests. Uh, so I, I do not see you, but I um, trust that you're there. <laughs> and uh, it, it means a lot uh, to, um, you know, be able to um, publish and have a, a, a conversation about it. So in terms of your question, Nadia, um, it is true that I did not write uh, this book as uh, in a thought of um, speculating in advance that this is part of a larger project or a trilogy, but it was towards the very end that I came to realize that this is really what has happened. So. Um, the first book, I would say, uh, in spite of partition, really does focus um, um, mostly on the past in the sense that I trace in literature, um, both Palestinian, Israeli, and North African, I trace the figure of the Arab Jew and uh, not necessarily a particular 
um, figure as much as a literary figure with all its implications um, as a figure that has um, been lost uh, to a political reality in which the, the idea of a slash between the identities, quote unquote, Jew on the one hand, Arab on the other side, um, has been created and distorted a, a, a long tradition of in which the, uh, the, the two, of course, um, being an Arab and being a Jew, being an Arab Jew and all its configurations uh, uh, have a, a, a vast history. Um, and it's a book that in some ways uh, is uh, a lamentation of this loss. Um, so, you know, that's why I figure it as, a, as, as mostly about a, a, a lost past or what I call the Arab Jew we were. Um, the second uh, book, uh, Visual Occupation, uh, was um, came out of uh, my uh, sense that I um, well, I mean, I, I, I was, uh, uh, like many others, uh, growing uh, in despair, you know, the, while, while the first book was written at a quote unquote moment of hope uh, the, uh, that, that, you know, later on was discovered as not so hopeful, the, the, the Oslo period. The second book was already written uh, uh, in the post uh, Oslo period, and it, um, it was really a sort of an attempt to capture the the ways in which the occupation, the Israeli occupation of Palestine sustains itself. Um, and mostly, so it's, it's really about how is it that this, um, that this reality, this present is able to continue to sustain itself and exist, et cetera, in the present, one that we are all to this degree or another aware of. And so it's really kind of a, a much more, um, uh, direct engagement with the present and with the question of the uh, visual politics of that present. I think when I came to write um, Becoming Palestine, of course, like many uh, other people who write books, I wasn't realizing that I'm writing a book to begin with, right? I mean, I was um, very intrigued with various artistic projects that I was following. I didn't realize that that there was a lot that in what intrigued me that was actually a similar kind of um, uh, of affect and project that I am happy to talk about. But um, once I sort of realized that and realized that uh, there is a an argument here that runs through and that I really think that there is a uh, book, I also also realize the incentive or what drew me is the I, I focus on a future or futurity or potentiality. And um, that's, I think, what drew me to these uh, projects and also why uh, the book um, is really about, you know, that the subtitle Towards an Archival Imagination of the Future is really about trying to open up ways of looking differently at the present or reading the present so that uh, we have an outlet for imagining alternative futures. And so th that's sort of where I found myself. And um, I think, you know, on a personal level, it comes from uh, a place where I think most of the artists are in that place too, where you, there, there's just as much capacity to uh, be, or, or a political effectiveness of being in a state of Melancholia, a mourning, and loss. And you know, you you sort of do want to start to imagine ways in which you may be able to imagine ways of changing reality, right? So moving forward. Yeah, yeah. I want to come back to the artist uh, in a moment, but I'm interested in um, talking to you a little bit about your broader argument on conceptual framework. Um, so it, it's clear that your book challenges common conceptions of the archive as being linked to historical imagination, you know, a, a place where we dig up old documents and discover truths about the past. And that's, of course, not only history, but also archaeology that sees itself as digging up the truths about the past. So what is your main argument about the archive in the more conceptual and political sense? And what is your take on digging up the truth? Right. 
Um, so I'll say a few things about this is the core question, of course. So first of all, it is important for me to stress that Becoming Palestine is um, not really a book about archives as much as it is about archival imagination, right? So it's about the activization of an archive uh, or archives or what it is it, that we think about archives. Um, there is in the book a general claim, um, but I also modify the general claim by saying that it is important for me to state that um, as much as I want to suggest that um, there is something um, productive about us looking at archives differently, which I will uh, mention, which is replacing the digging for uh, facts and, and uh, password in a, a way by finding or looking at the present itself as an archive, but as an archive that um, hosts traces of the future not just traces of the past. And that the kind of uh, archival imagination that I'm speaking about is one in which we learn to, and I don't think it's an easy task, but it's to learn to read the present itself as an archive. And if the present itself is, is, is an archive, the place from which we are supposedly reading it is the future. Right, And if that is uh, where it is, then what we're looking for is those clues or those traces that will lead us towards that future. Um, while that is a general um, argument, and uh, I have been asked uh, uh, in, in an interview that I um, held if, I, uh, if the book is an attack on history or historians, so I do want to make clear that um, it's not really an attack on history. I think history is, has its place. I think it's very important to, you know, find out uh, facts and, and, of course, establish um, uh, narratives about the past. I think that the argument is that, uh, or if there is a critique, it's about the monopoly of the archives by history was a capital H, meaning the discipline of history, the idea that there is one way to read archives, and then there's one way of um, um, de determining what counts as an archive, what doesn't count as an archive. So yes, that in that sense, there is a critique. Now, more specifically, when it comes to my historical, you could say, uh, argument about the specificity of the role of archives in the case of Palestine, uh, Palestine and Israel. Here, I think I have um, an argument that really is specific. It may uh, uh, be true in other cases, and I think it is, but I um, think that with quite certainty, we can say it is true for this case, which is uh, what I talk about when I talk about archival fatigue. So I think that with um, the uh, case of uh, the role of archives in um, finding out information in this particular case, there is a sort of um, has been a, uh, uh, a saturation of historical archives and kind of uh, uh, with the 80s with the quote unquote new historians of the um, uh, when the Israeli uh, state archives opened and uh, the uh, quote unquote new historians of the uh, Israeli academia started to uh, um, explore lots of uh, the um, the documents that have documented the historical documents of the um, Nakba and, and further atrocities the question at some point comes, uh, which is, once the novelty, if there is a novelty to the arguments, because once again, we have to remember that, yes, those historians revealed those in, that information, but it's not that that information has not been already known and actually archived and circulated if, uh, among Palestinians, right? I mean, people whose villages were lost didn't need the new historians to tell them that their villages were lost, right? So there was an affirmation of information already known. However, it was presented as a, uh, uh, which is how historians often present archival information as a discovery, right? 
My argument is really in that sense simple, that there are no secrets. We shouldn't think about these as secrets. The secrets that the historians find are known secrets. I'm not saying there is not details, numbers, facts that come out. The bigger question is, do these findings, do these historical diggings actually result in anything that has ethical or political implications? Because the fact that people know facts and that now we have written facts don't necessarily translate into any kind of change. And I mean, the fact is there isn't a change on grounds. So the, the fact that we now have the quote unquote state archive to reaffirm knowledge that we supposedly didn't know before seem to have produced very little effect or uh, 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 political change. So um, that, that is really um, sort of what I'm trying to suggest that in this juncture where we have a, actually a, a saturation of archive where we have, um, again, not equal access, of course, not um, uh, archival information that is uh, circulated equally to all, not at all, but we do have a saturation of archival information and data and historical numbers etc. What happens, I think, is that we're risking what I call archival fatigue, which is that we basically get articulations of the same facts over and over again. That is not just not productive, but I think it also is numbing. I think the political impact of it is numbing. When you hear about an atrocity over and over again, and there is no outcry and the the uh, um, or the outcry sustains itself for a very short time the impact is one of numbing um, and that's why uh, I, I think not I don't think that the argument about the futurity of the archive is so much mine as one that I have learned through the artistic projects that I read closely. I do think that uh, that in this younger generation of um, artists, Palestinian artists, there is a certain um, negation of the historical role of the archive or a certain um, uh, desire to move away from the commitment to fact into reestablishing a fact as a fact and a kind of an opening to a different kind of commitment, which I presume we will talk about. Yeah, I'm going to push a little bit on that because um, on the issue of, so, you know, people who have lost land or their homes don't, I mean, it's not like new information, okay? But I mean, when I'm sort of thinking about, I guess, also parallel situation in terms of, you know, Kurds in Iraq. But the, the question is not about simply about new information. The question is about who gets to tell the narrative and who is be, who gets to um, get the ear of people and what's the hegemonic narrative or challenging it. And so, you know, I'm sort of wondering if you can reflect a little bit on that. And I also wonder whether is it possible for the artist to take that position that critical position of the way that the archives have been used historically precisely because there have been generations of historians doing that work yes um yes that's a that's a that's a very good uh, comment and once again it's um you know, because we're talking, uh, it, it maybe seems that I'm, you know, sort of really conflating these two options. Mm -hmm. I do think uh, they, the, the historical approach and what I call the this artistic activation of the archive are not, um, you know, they're not mutually exclusive, nor are they in any of the arts, uh, artist uh, projects that I talk about. Um, I think, um, the question of who gets to tell the story is very important and key. But here I do think there is a generational difference. Um, and I do talk about it in the book. Um, I think, uh, you know, when, when, when Edward Said um, uh, writes about the, the right to narrate 
and the importance of holding the narrative. I think that remains, of course, a key element. However, I think that there is, um, or at least that's what I identified in um, these artworks, there is also a kind of movement away from the demand to narrate and a kind of desire to almost refuse to narrate. And my understanding of it is, or my reading of it is that there is a certain position or accumulation of time in which from the position of uh, the one who has been wronged, say, there comes a time where um, that, that in placed in that position has to ask oneself, how many times will the responsibility of documenting and stating the atrocity fall on me? And how many times will I be allowed to speak only from that position? And that is something I think very strong that I found in, uh, uh, and also came out in all of the interviews with the artists, that it's not a rejection of uh, the importance, and there's a strong recognition of the importance of previous artists and previous historians, absolutely. But there is also a kind of recognition that at some point, the responsibility or the tipping of the burden of speaking only as or documenting only as is, is starts to tilt over, especially over the right, which is not just the right to narrate, but also the right to imagine. And I think this is what this book is about. Who has the right to imagine, right? So that there is the, the famous Godard um, quote that people like to return to where Godard uh, says, um, I don't have the quote in front of me, but Godard says um, that um, Palestinians make the stuff of documentary and uh, Jews make the stuff of imagination or fiction. Um, so uh, uh, in a way, for me, this is a, a kind of a response to that uh, limiting position of, of subjecthood, but also of, of a place for artistic and, 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 and any kind of position of narrating, which is the, the stronger position that one has access to at some point has to be the right to imagine, the right to, and the right to imagine is the right to the future. Yeah. Right? And I think that is something that all of the artists that I talk about in this uh, book really insist on. And I, find it very inspiring and, and um, invigorating. Yes, yeah, I, I really found that moving and inspiring as well. And yeah, I'm, I'm convinced by uh, the significance of generation here. It seems to play an important role. And I think there are parallels also with uh, younger generation of artists elsewhere in the Middle East and probably also globally. Yeah. So maybe moving now from, from your vision of the archival imagination linked to a possible future and imagined alternative, how does that translate specifically into the issue of Palestine becoming Palestine? Right. Um, so <clears throat> let me try to explain what I exactly mean by becoming Palestine. So um, I. Um, those who know um, Gil Deleuze it immediately recognize that becoming is sort of a stamp <laughs> of Deleuze, whether we like it or not. So, uh, but I do use it to invoke uh, Deleuze's work, and especially uh, in order to uh, invoke the distinction that Deleuze makes between the poetic political intervention on the one hand and historical investigation on the other hand. Um, so, for 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 Deleuze, and that has been very um, productive for me because he gives this particular epistemic role to art, right? So for Deleuze, I quote, art has the potential to resist the theology of history by opening imagination to yet to come future. So in this sense, um, art is really where uh, I see following uh, Deleuze, um, art has the ability to return us to the present, to where we are, but make the present less immediately recognizable. Um, less immediately recognizable, let's say, as an accumulation of facts, 
of historical facts that we have up to a certain point, right? That is, uh, uh, in his terminology, sort of the, the, the accumulation of historical events. Um, and that's sort of all we know how to, to narrate, things that happened, things that didn't happen, what is now is the accumulation of it. The question is um, um, whether um, art can really generate a different way of looking at this present. I do think that it is important to take this very seriously. Um, I think that the, um, the way that, uh, that that artists and in this book, uh, I um, all the chapters follow artistic work. So the way that artists um, allow us to revisit the present is the only way in which we can learn to read the present as holding some potentiality. And uh, that potentiality doesn't come from a reality we already know, right? It is a becoming. Now, what do I mean by becoming Palestine? Um, I use the term Palestine because um, as many before me have noticed, Palestine is not just the name of a place. It is a name of a, it's a name of a place. It's a place, it's a name of a non-place. It's a name of a non-state that nevertheless, um, it, it, it remains a geographical state. It's a name of a uh, his, history that has uh, been lost, the history that we're trying to preserve. It's also a name of what I try to argue in the book, something we don't actually know yet, right? It's, it, it's been circulating as metaphors, as yearning, um, as, as, as a loss, as something that is still to come. That is very powerful, I think, as a literary scholar to have a term or word that actually carries so much, carries so much more than a clear um, signified and signifier, right? There's, it, it opens. So, um, I, so for me, becoming Palestine is a becoming of a future that is produced through the present. It is transcribed only or limited only in the sense that it is, it's not a sort of a, a dream out of nowhere. It is a reality, an imagined reality that is to, um, uh, that, that is carried contemporary as a potential in our present, but we can't outline it. I can't say what that will look like, nor do I have the desire to say what that would look like. And all of the artworks that I look at, I read them. Of course, they, the artists themselves might have other intentions, but I read them as directing us towards that potentiality, towards that option and openness, rather than as a, um, as a script of what that is going to be. The one thing I can say, and I think it's pretty blunt and, and open, is that that becoming Palestine does involve an undoing, mm. right? It's the, 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 because this isn't becoming Palestine slash Israel or becoming Israel slash Palestine. That is not an option. Mm. It's not an option in the works and it's not an option in this potentiality because in order for the becoming to take place, the, the certain realities, which is the current, um, the current archive, which is the current order of the present, mm -hmm. has to be changed. Mm -hmm. And the configuration of Israel, if it uh, is able to become part of becoming Palestine, can no longer even carry that name. And that is simply because the archive of the stamp of that particular word, I'm very strong on figures rather than uh, what the, the, the word means, that word already includes a certain negation, whether we like it or not, but it is a political reality. So in that sense, yes, if I, I, I have been asked, um, what is the place of um, Israel in it? It doesn't have a place in it. That doesn't mean that uh, Israelis don't have a place in it. It means that the configuration of the state of Israel does not have a place in, in this becoming. Mm. Yeah, so I think it would be really good for readers, viewers, um, well, viewers, not readers, <laughs> to actually get some concrete examples now, if you could sort of share 
you know, how do Palestinian artists, writers, filmmakers, dancers, even now one chapter you, you look at dancers and photographers, how do they actually imagine becoming Palestine and how do they engage the right. archive differently? Right. Um, so this is, um, this is a very, very hard to do yes. uh, in a talk. Um, yeah. I, so what I, so first of all, it is very important for me to say, I say it in the book, but it, 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 it really is important for me to say that um, all the thoughts that I've had in over the years that generated this book come through the work of, uh, my engagement was the work of the artists. I think art thinks, I think all of these artists are thinkers. Um, I think they're brilliant thinkers. So I would like to mention uh, their names and also to encourage people to, um, um, you know, all of them have, uh, all of them are, are, are young happening and have websites. So uh, I really think, I mean, not, I think most of the work is available uh, to, to, um, to watch online. So I really recommend that people will um, look them up. Uh, so I want to thank uh, all of those, Jamana Mana, Basil Abbas, Ruan Abu Rahim, uh, Omar Al Rabi, Shuruk Harb, Kamal Al Jafari, Larissa Sansur, uh, Farah Saleh, and Basma Al Sharif. And there are others, but these are the main artists that I uh, discuss. All of them have been remarkably generous with their time um, and interviews and 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 and, and uh, their work. So I um, I'm very very thankful. Um, maybe we can uh, Barbara maybe can show some of the images that I sent, and I will try to do justice by mentioning a few words about each of the works. Um, so yes, so. Um, um, one of the chapters uh, focuses on uh, Jumana Mana's um, remarkable um, short film, uh, longest short film, A Magical Substance Flows Into Me from 2015. Uh, so this is, for example, a work um, that returns very explicitly to an archive in the archives. So um, Mana um, actually um, goes back to, she, she uh, uh, visits uh, the um, um, the archive in Jerusalem, the Israeli uh, archive, to find the work of the German musicologist Robert Lachmann, uh, who is, you see his uh, photo in this image, and those are notes from his, um, his folder, which includes his notes for a radio show he held at the BBC in 1936 until 1940 when he passed away. He only spent four years in Palestine. He uh, was a German Jew. He had to leave his uh, job at the uh, um, uh, Berlin um, uh, General uh, Library. And he, um, what he, his specialty was what he called Arab uh, music. He's in Palestine in those years, and he. What is fascinating about his work is that he makes, um, you know, he makes these programs. He records there's uh, hours and hours of music recording of um, Palestinian uh, music, and he makes no distinction in his recordings between whether the uh, musicians. I mean, he notes that you know those are uh, Jews, those are uh, Druze, those are uh, Palestinian uh, uh, from this area, those are. Um, uh, um, uh, Palestinians for another area, but all of the, the point of his project is that he is very committed as a good ethnomusicologist and a uh, 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 um, trained German Orientalist. He wants to make sure that the Arab music remains authentic. And it's it's quite interesting and funny in a way because he has all these fights with local musicians because they are incorporating changes. Part of them are from Western music. And he argues with them that that's not okay. They need to stay authentic. They need to you know stay committed to uh, scales and the, uh, uh, the um, authentic uh, Arab scales, et cetera. Now, um, when uh, uh, this, uh, when 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 Mana, a, a young um, uh, Palestinian filmmaker, returns to this archive, I think she does amazing things with it, and that's what I mean by activization. So, first of all, she visits an uh, an archive that is located in um, the Israeli National Archive, but she uh, pulls it out and tells a very different story. First of all, she tells a story. I mean, the the almost ironic. Uh, 
thing is that um, Robert Lachman, who is very well known to German ethnomusicologists, that I found out very, very well known. Um, when I've asked um, uh, scholars and historians in Israel, nobody knew who this is. So um, uh, the the kind of uh, irony of, of of history, where you know Mana actually pulls out this um, this um, work out of the Israeli archive, and by pulling out this out of the archive, she's able to return, and I um, think she does it brilliantly, return to what is in essence um, almost a, a, you know, a cliche, naive German Orientalist project, right? But she, in, in reviving it, and what she does is that she then takes the recordings that Lachman has produced, and she then goes to the same communities that he visited or that he had in his studio, and she records her own recording. And that's what the film is about. She films the recordings of her new archive, right? The, the new generations, some of them of the same families of the musicians that Lachman records. Um, and so she uh, creates this newish digital on her iPhone recordings of, of these musicians. What I think she's able to do this way is critically re-engage what is in essence an Orientalist archive, but re-engages it in a way that uh, brings that archive to into a dialogue with a present that was completely un, inconceivable in the um, in the eyes of Lachman, which is the reality of Palestine that her film reveals which is made of, of gates, fences, walls, separations, the exact opposite of the quote unquote Arab music, you know, uh, uh, kind of Oriental, we're all together. And in doing so, I think traces a kind of, I would call a pessim, a op optimistic, but cautious optimistic projection to a future that might not necessarily be either or, right? Dialectically, it will not be uh, this uh, oriental fantasy of music is going to sort of uh, uh, erase all changes, but it certainly will not be a reality made of uh, uh, fences and gates that uh, separates, uh, uh, crudely separates individuals. So this is one example, and I'm. it's very hard for me to do justice to the film or to, even to my own reading of it, uh, but um, it's the best I could do under this, uh, under the circumstances and with the time frame, because I want to get to some other examples. So we can move to another. A very, very, very different project uh, by um, Abrahim and Abbas, um, uh, which is a complex four year project, and yet my mask is powerful. The project itself uh, includes as a whole, not just an exhibition. This is part of the, an exhibition in a, uh, in a gallery, but the project as a whole includes um, the two artists taking um, Palestinian youth to visit villages in uh, uh, the 1948 um, uh, borders, uh, uh, villages, um, um, uh, Palestinian villages that are unmarked on, on maps, but that are uh, located based on archival information and, you know, uh, 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 um, uh, people's own personal archives. Um, and um, then another layer of it, so there is the, the tours themselves, and then there is another layer to the project, which is the documenting of the tours and the uh, sort of generating of what they call an organic archive because they collect uh, vegetation, um, uh, soil, uh, pieces of runes. They collect all, all of those uh, from the present and generate uh, in uh, galleries. There might be another image, if I'm not mistaken, Barbara, that has some of those images. Yes, so um, they they have both the notes from the tours and some of the vegetations from the location. So this is a a living archive, right? It is a, 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 a um, an archive that isn't actually set uh, in, in a 
in a, in a basement in some library, but is actually uh, open and available. And I think this is something that uh, this project really insists on as part of a democratization of archives. And the fact that um, uh, um, I think this uh, there's a strong sort of demand in the work to say, we, we will not just, uh, we, no, we don't want right to state archives, we will create the archive, right? The personal um, um, collection uh, and, and the actual materials of the present is gonna be the archive. We're not going to depend on state archives, not to mention in this particular case, of course, as many of our listeners are sure know, um, the um, it's not that Palestinian archives didn't exist. It's that many collections, book collections, um, the, the PLO archive, the film archive have been confiscated, right? So they are de facto in the hands of, um, of uh, or of photographs, endless amount of, of photographs that are in the hands, not just of the Israeli state archive, but the IDF archive has confiscated material. So again, it is at some point, the kind of uh, moving away from I want to I want to place at your table <laughs> or an entrance to the archive to thank you I'll create my archive uh, I think it's a very empowering and then there is another layer which is the uh, sort of brilliant and mischievous part of this project which is that um, during this uh, the the span of these years. Um, Basil and Rowan uh, found out that uh, the Israeli Archaeology Museum was running a big um, exhibit of Neolithic, Neolithic uh, masks. And um, perhaps there, are, there is an image, I'm not sure, um, Barbara? No. So maybe if you go one backwards, you will see um, here. So do you see the, 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 the image of the mask of the man holding a mask? They produced uh, copies of those masks, um, and they actually started to um, take those copies. Uh, some of the copies are actually, I, I believe, currently in the museum, um, um, the Palestinian National Museum in Ramallah, but I, I, I'm not sure. But this particular, the mask, they started to take the masks on the tours and to generate a kind of guerrilla um, digital information in which they were <laughs> sending information that there is a, a, a dangerous group of Palestinian youth running with masks into villages. And, uh, and the, that hacking movement, in addition to being mischievous and, and, and uh, funny, actually also um, created a, another uh, uh, kind of twist in the uh, archive in the sense that if you Google Neolithic mask, Neolithic mask, Israel, et cetera, you will come up with this project before you will come up with the, pro you will come up with information of dangerous Palestinian youth uh, before you come up with the actual archeological project that was done in Israel. So it is de facto also, you know the 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 biggest archive that we have Google data is now um, controlled by this project rather than the muse the Israeli museum. So I think it's uh, altogether brilliant. It also involves uh, um, Adrian Rich's poetry. It's 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 so many so multifaceted that I can only do injustice. But um, all of their work is 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 exceptional. So we can move to the next project. You can interrupt me on Nadia if... Well, um, I mean, just uh, maybe, uh, I just wanted to mention to the audience again, if you have any questions or comments, um, please put them in the Q&A. And as you go uh, along and speak about maybe one other project or two, um, can you address the um, concept of citationality and recitationality? Because that seems to be key. Yeah to some of these projects, and you mentioned that in yes. your book. Yeah, thank you. So um, actually, it's a great opportunity um, before discussing um, Larissa Sansour's uh, project, because so yes, uh, thank you, uh, Neda. So the for me, um, it actually also happened as I was um, immersed in these works, I suddenly realized that the most powerful um, sort of um, 
artistic and political intervention that I found in all of these works, all of them, was this uh, was the the use of citation and recitation, right? So whether it is the mask as a copy and um, in and in, in um, Abbas and, and Ruan make a, a a big deal of the fact that the archive needs to be an archive of a copy rather than the original. It's a kind of a critique of the authenticity of the archive, uh, or whether it's as we saw with Jumana Mana. Um, the recitation of the musical recording, right? So we listen to Al Ahmed's recording, but then we listen to the lesser recording, the the the, the iPhone recording, and that is all. But it, it also works in terms of citation. In the case of um, and 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 so when I say citation, I I am referring to um, intertextuality. So I'm I'm using Roland Barthes' um, uh, argument that every text is a uh, is 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 made of traces of other texts, and uh, that uh, reading is a reading basically of archive, right? That because every text is a is is traces of other texts, um, and I um, I I think that uh, what this enables these artists to do is also to really create every each one of the artworks in itself is an archive right? because it hosts so many of these citations that it, it's very it's it's in itself it opens itself to a reading as if it uh, too is an archive um larissa censures uh in the future they ate the finest porcelain is um a um, 25 or so minute sci-fi film in which uh, the main character, which we see here, is called the narrator terrorist. And the film is set in a unknown place, unknown time. Um, it is um, very uh, dystopic in its aesthetic, it, uh, but it has a, um, uh, um, also some kind of a, a um, utopic dystopic uh tension in it the the it's an essay film so you while you have images and um barbara if you can move to one other image here you, you see the porcelain if you see here most of the images they move in between still images that seem uh, almost um, orientalist and are are uh, are um um archaic on purpose and a kind of very futuristic images that I don't have right here, but they are um, of spaceships. It's sort of this very strange combination of uh, 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 biblical spaceship um, uh, with many, many visual connotations to mostly the New Testament. Um, but um, the narration of all of this is uh, a session of the narrator terrorist in psychoanalysis uh, with her therapist in which she is trying to understand her own trauma. Um, again, I invite people to see it and read uh, the reading because it's hard to manage this way. But my main argument uh, or reading of this is that uh, Sansor is um, offering us a very acute critique of archaeology uh, as a uh, field in general, but also uh, specifically uh, the role of archaeology for um, Zionism and promoting uh, uh, Zionist uh, narrative, and that she very successfully and ironically um, presents the Zionist appeal, achievement, political uh, force itself as a science fiction. Right? So um, again, it's, it's this, the, the, the issue of citation is very prominent for this, uh, this work um, because almost every frame is, is, a, is a, a mix of citations. Uh, and it is this um, citation and recitationality, I think that enables the propelling or the temporal propelling of the archive from a uh, backwards looking to a backwards that is informing a forward, but a forward that inevitably has to remain somewhat unknown. Yeah. Thank you, Gil. I suggest that in the interest of time, I mean, I know there are Absolutely. more images and- um, We can at least, say, can Barbara can show them. I won't- Yeah, say. just if he goes through them and then, um, because I want to go to to the uh, question that we have from the audience.
Yeah, I think that was really, um, I know that it's of course difficult to do that in this format, but I think it was really helpful to see, to hear you talk about, you know, concrete examples and see some of the images at least to give us a, a sense. Um, so there's a question from Avi Kotzereburg. Um, thank you very much for your talk. Have you interviewed also artists who stand in contact with Israeli artists? Um, I mean, I, I, I actually, uh, Jomana Mana in her film, um, there is um, um, a long section uh, with an Israeli musician. Um, so um, uh, that is, I mean, obviously they're in, uh, in touch. I, I, um, yeah, I interviewed only the artists that I work, uh, that I wrote about. Um, so, um, I mean, there wasn't a discussion about sort of about Israeli art in that sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, um, of course, as um, you know, gender studies scholar, I, I can't <laughs> help but ask you, uh, you know, what is the role of gender and sexuality in these creative imaginations of a possible Palestine, a different reality? Yes, um, it's a great question. Um, if I were to rewrite the book, I would put much more emphasis on, on this. Um, it actually, um, I, I, I do mention it here and there, and I will uh, explain why I think it's very important. But so let me say a few things first about what I did do, which is that I think, um, for some example, um, um, there are works, so we didn't talk about um, Saleh, who was uh, um, uh, um, Farah Saleh, who is the dancer, who uh, also remarkable work, um, does explicit work on, uh, on with gender. And, you know, in the book, I, I show how she uses an archival photo and then restages it as a, uh, in the present as a performance, but in the photo, uh, all the figures are, are men and she changes it to um, uh, women and men. That's just an example. In other cases, you have the places, right? So um, uh, Jamana uh, often films uh, in the kitchen. She talks about uh, the kitchen um, and the importance of women in the kitchen. So some of these things uh, do come up. Um, I say I would have done more because I think that there's also more substantial structural issues here that are not necessarily just about, you know, when do we talk about women or women's spaces, but really uh, gender and uh, 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 queer reading that, um, that there were many opportunities that um, I think still are, are there. Um, I am hoping I, I have a, um, an essay on a different work of uh, Tramana Mana that is a that is a completely you know sort of a, a queer reading of of her films, and um, I think there are cases uh, Shuruk's work Shuruk Harbs. There is a very um, very interesting place that I touch on the gender and sexuality, but not enough. So um, yes, I think that it's 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 beyond important, and I think that. Um, you know, sometimes when you're very, very focused on one mm. element, you kind of give in on the other. And um, that's a place that that requires more, more work and more attention. It's sometimes hard. And I believe many of you, I'm sure, uh, Nadia, yourself too, it's very hard to know how to exactly do that. Because on the one hand, I think we do all know what it is that we mean when we say that there is a a very queer structure to mm -hmm. the works or to the, but but it's clear and not clear, right? Because I also don't want to completely evacuate the term queer from, you know, actual living ex experiences. So the short answer is I took the easy route was that one. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I was obviously, um, could read between the lines that uh, you know it was there, and I yeah would be interested to see if maybe you take it to um, you know some of the aspects. Yes, I, I absolutely think that yes. would be yeah. I would think be it would be great. Beautiful. So Agil, uh, we are almost running out of time, but I would like to read out two questions, and if you can, could then sort of 
uh, try to uh, address them as quickly as possible. So one is by Brigitte Hermann's wonderful presentation and book. I'm doing research on how artistic practices could open the justice imagination for Syrian, also in going beyond forensic truth practices. How do you see the relation between artistic practices and resisting injustices? And then a second question um, by Nat Muller. Thank you for your wonderful talk and book, Gil. I was taken by what you said about art making the present less immediately recognizable. Science fiction is the mode that does that too. Can you elaborate a little on the science fictionality in these works, even if only present implicit and how they destabilize conceptions of the archive? Um, Okay, and then one final question. This is, has to be the final one, and I know that you can't do justice to them, but I will read it out. Uh, Maurice Abilini, thank you for your talk. As far as I understand, the majority of the artists you focus on in becoming Palestine live outside of Israel-Palestine. Could we say that the kind of archives you're referring to are di diasporic in character? So this is a lot. I know you can't address everything. I mean, first of all, I want to thank um, uh, the 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 audience for these questions um, uh, uh, and 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 to say hi to uh, my friends uh, and thank you for being here. <laughs> but uh, they, these are really they're, they're fantastic questions. I would like to um, ask that they will be sent to me if if it's possible after because I I you know I'm happy to I to continue this uh, and it actually helps me think. Um, Wow, uh, let me think how I do this. So um, maybe I'll start with, with the question of the diasporic. Um, yes and no. Um, I think that yes, in the sense that the more space one has from, the, uh, from any configuration of nation state, I think the more space for imagination one has. Uh, but that's a longer um, um, uh, thing that we we can discuss um, and and Maurice I, I I know your work and I I think it is very much related to questions of uh, you're right about um, diaspora. The other the only thing I have to mention is that of course um, uh, when we talk about this it's a little bit hard to know because in some cases you know it's diaspora diasporic is kind of to me seems like something that you do by choice but uh, I don't know if you know necessarily. Um, all those who are not living in Palestine or Israel do that uh, 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 by choice, um, or whether they, you know, um, basically, I don't know why it's 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 it, it, anyway. It's it's hard to 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 tell whether you know they they um, they uh, choose to do that or they simply feel you know that uh, living um, under uh, under the reality in in, in which um, they are marked as uh, second rate citizens is not uh, or or just not citizens is not an option but um that's that's about that uh in terms of uh, the question about the syrian um refugees first of all it, it's great i think it's very important to work on it um i would say very briefly that the um the place of uh, artistic practice and resisting injustice has to do a lot with this issue that I mention a lot in the book, which is the insisting on the right to imagine. Uh, because the one thing that uh, is taken away, you know, we have uh, the famous uh, um, Hannah Arendt, uh, um, have, have, the, the refugees don't have the right to write, but the right to write is, 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 is very minimal. You know, it's essential, but it's very minimal. Human beings need more than that. Um, and we, um, I think, did uh, become um, accustomed to a certain kind of uh, discourse. I, I, I do blame Agamben for it uh, and his homo sucker, um, and a certain kind of like bare minimum in which, uh, you know, anything added to it is uh, some kind of like already not a fully authentic suffering being. Uh, but uh, no, even the very suffering being, uh, it, it is not enough to just exist, uh, right? So it is the right to imagine. And, and without the right to imagine, which I think is the right to artistic expression, artistic uh, thinking, etc., 
Um, there is no um, real resistance, I, I believe, or it's a very minimal uh, resistance. So I hope this is helpful. Um, for Nat's uh, question, um, wow, it's 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 um, yes, uh, it's true. Science fiction is 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 key here. Um, I would say that in all of these works, there is some kind of a dialectics between suggesting that we have to move to science fiction. On the other hand, uh, but also that political reality is science fiction, right? I mean, that is the what is so powerful about Larissa Sansur's film, at least in how I read it, is that Zionism is science fiction. Um, in, um, in, in partly it has worked and continues to work, not because it uh, is a political, uh, logical outcome of reality, but because it actually... Um, it, 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 it started with, uh, like many other political projects, started with an imagination and it triggered uh, a very long and, 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 and for various reasons, um, imaginary um, impetus, right? So um, I think that's where the question of, you know, um, that is important for me, which is that, um, politics is science fiction. Mm -hmm. um, so the question is, you know, what science fiction we read as science fiction and what we read as serious and political. Yeah, and not just science fiction, but increasingly, I believe the dystopian, you right. know. Um, Gil, uh, of course, I could continue, ask you lots of questions. It's been a really interesting and fun to be in conversation with you, but unfortunately, we've run out of time. I'd like to thank you very much. I'd like to thank uh, the audience for joining us and sending us questions. Uh, we will be, uh, we have recorded uh, this conversation and we'll make it uh, available in a few days. So um, you can rewatch it or send it to your friends and colleagues. Thank you. And I invite um, my uh, friends and all, all people in, in the audience to follow up with um, uh, emails. I'm um, one is always happy to continue to talk about questions that, you know, preoccupy us all. Thank you so much, Nadia. Thank you, Barbara. And thank you all for being here. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone.